Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, of course, I would like to thank Kulshin Hoppe and her charming husband for inviting me to this place. <laughs> and uh, whether this, whether this <laughs> is something you would like to do, thanking them for inviting me, that remains to be seen. Uh, my topic is uh, problems, or rather a, a look, a short look within half an hour on the uh, philosophical foundations of libertarianism. Now, I'm not going to talk about any particular author. This is just based on uh, nearly 40 years of watching libertarians at close range, so to speak. Right? So it's, it's not a uh, uh, dissection of any particular uh, piece of writing. More as it were, the, the state of mind of libertarianism. And I have two uh, problems there, and both stem from the, uh, the same source, as it were. Uh, that is that libertarianism, as we know it, uh, is a modern ideology. Right? It, it shares, it, it not shares, but shares in all the uh, properties of modern thought. And that creates a problem because modern thought is not particularly hospitable to uh, human freedom at the, uh, the basic philosophical level. Right? This is evident, for example, if you uh, go back, starting with present obsession with neuroscience, right? the idea that there is no freedom in man because it's all simple uh, uh, neuro activity, uh, neural activity, everything drives. Uh, these are physical processes. There is no room for uh, freedom. But this goes back to the, uh, the beginning of modern times, and that is one of the things I would like to uh, discuss. This idea that human beings are, as it were, just tissues, natural tissues, with rather peculiar behavior, uh, some of which were highlighted by the previous uh, speaker. Another aspect of modernism uh, that affects, or modernity, that affects libertarianism is, I think, the uh, inclination towards legalism, the idea that law is a legal system. Uh, now, this is so, uh, as it were, given to the modern mind that it's almost impossible to think that it, it should uh, not be the case, that law is not a system. Right? Uh, so these are two ideas, very modern. Why modern? Because they were completely ab absent during the uh, previous period of the Middle Ages. So modern times is uh, juxtaposed to uh, medieval times, and medieval times had a totally different view of the world and of the human being. Right? <coughs> so, libertarians occasionally show some interest in medieval thinking, and in the, in the medieval period, uh, for one reason mostly, that is, it was a, a stateless order. Right? Uh, there were no states in the, mid in the Middle Ages. There were rulers, there were kings, there were leaders and followers, but there was not, no such thing as a state. So the, uh, the whole idea uh, that we have of society was uh, absent in the uh, Middle Ages. That requires a complete rethinking of all we know or think we know about human relations. Uh, the second point of interest for libertarians of the Middle Ages is that uh, the word libertarianism itself, when it was first introduced as a technical philosophical uh, term in the uh, 18th century, it referred to the doctrine of freedom of will. Right? And uh, it is difficult to think of any theory uh, that is truly libertarian is it rejects freedom of the will. 
certainly if uh, you connect that with the freedom of thinking, freedom of thought, because if there is no will, uh, then there is no rational thought either. Because if you think that rational thought is a, a sort of automatic process, right, something that just happens, uh, that will happen without you thinking, then you have a very peculiar notion of uh, thinking. So you have to, the will to think rightly is a necessary condition for thinking rightly. Uh, otherwise, uh, who knows what would be considered right thinking. So these are uh, two points, statelessness and the uh, commitment, the philosophical commitment to freedom of the will, uh, which distinguishes, to put it uh, shortly, the medi medieval idea of the human person, person from the modern idea of the human individual. Right? So the, uh, the person, just to use this as a label, comprises not only the individual organism, but also the individual as a personal uh, being, thinking, judging, willing, uh, having a conscience. Whereas the, individ the modern individual is purely defined in terms of his physical individuality. Right? From the point of view of reasoning, that makes a difference. Uh, whether you accept freedom of the will, as I, as I noted, uh, whether you accept freedom of the will as part of your definition of the human person, because if you are arguing, uh, uh, you want to be seen as making a right point, something that is right, and something that ought to be accepted by the other. Uh, it is not just a sales talk, arguing. Right? I, I'm trying to sell you something. <laughs> look how elegant I am and look how charming uh, my product is. So you try to make an argument in terms of right and old. But these are two words that uh, fare very badly in uh, modern thinking. Right? Modern philosophy has almost <laughs> no room for uh, the old and right, as the uh, ought looked at from the other side, <coughs> this is uh, hard to place in modern thinking. Now, uh, let me if we go back to the, the period where the the Middle Ages certainly ended, and modern, time was, modern times was about to begin, uh, we uh, stumble upon a very interesting figure, uh, Martin Luther, right, who is definitely uh, recognized as one of the fathers of modernity, although he, is, he was an Augustinian monk, but he uh, shook up the medieval world, the Catholic medieval world, to such a degree that nothing would ever be the same, not even uh, the Catholic Church. How did his uh, ideas, his reformist ideas in theological matters translate into modern uh, individual, individualism roughly by the following steps. Right? Uh, you know, he uh, advocated the principles sola fide, sola scriptura, and sola gratia. People live by faith alone, they live by Holy Scripture alone, and they will be saved by uh, God's grace alone. There is no room for any uh, individual uh, activity or merit there. Because he was so pessimistic about human beings that he uh, denied that they were capable of doing any good. Right? So his view of mankind was uh, whatever you do, good or bad, is nothing you do, 
it is something God does. So you are merely a passive thing in, uh, in the world. Anything you do is really God's work, no matter what the moral qualification. So human actions were in fact completely divorced from uh, categories of right and wrong. Right? That's the clear uh, implication here. The church should not judge you for your rightness or your wrongness. That is only God who can do that. Uh, and all the rest uh, is irrelevant. Right? You, uh, in saying that, he had the idea that we uh, all have, as it were, an inner sight, which is the reservation, the reserved place where each of us meets God, but outside that private conscience, uh, there was the idea of a private conscience, outside of that there was no place for God in the world. God is completely uh, apart from the world, except that, as he uh, said, uh, as I quoted earlier, everything that happens in the world is God's word. So you cannot criticize anything in the world because then you are criticizing God. And that was completely out of the question. Uh, you do not criticize God. So whatever happens, uh, you have to accept as God's word. This led to, uh, as I said, the, the, the idea of a privatized conscience, which is, if you consider it well, an oxymoron, right? Uh, the word itself, conscience, means knowledge shared, conscientia. But if you cut the, uh, the shared part out of it, everyone is, is the sole judge of everything uh, he thinks or does. Right? There is no uh, judge apart from uh, one's own convictions, and that is part of the the modern individualism, right, where the individual can say, well, that's where I stand. Right? I do not have to just justify myself to anybody. This privatized conscience had, uh, of course, a devastating uh, influence on arg argumentation, because argumentation is always an appeal to another's conscience. When you argue, you appeal to at least his ideas of right thinking. So, no, no, that's, that doesn't follow. Eh? That's, that's a wrong conclusion. You have standards of excellence in thinking to which you appeal. But most arguments, argumentations, are not simply about rightness in thinking, but also rightness in, in acting. So you argue always by appealing to another's conscience, that is the things he shares or she shares or you think they share with you uh, and then you try to find out what the common basis is and then work out to a common conclusion. And the philosophical dimension of argumentation is that you try to arrive at conclusions that are valid for all human beings, so universally valid conclusions. But when you have uh, all privatized consciences, which are not really accessible to outsiders, then of course, how do you argue? It becomes just bluffing and threatening, right? I will, I will win, not because I am right, but because you are not uh, a match for me. This, it becomes a contest rather than an argumentation a search for uh, <coughs> a search for the common truth. As a result, uh, one of the pivots of medieval thinking, the idea of natural law had to go, because uh, if the world as it is, in all its details, is the work of God, not of any man, then of course there is no way you can criticize the world as it is, and you cannot criticize anything in the world on the basis of principles that are of general validity, because according to the, the Lutheran conception, uh, the individual man, woman, has no mind 
or not enough mind to say anything of value concerning the true nature of the world. It is not open to inspection. All these ideas are, of course, dynamite uh, con when you consider them from the uh, medieval point of view, but looking back from today, it's all very individualistic, right? You can have, uh, you can mitigate some of the, the sayings, uh, which is what other reformers did, right? They, they did not follow Luther in his extreme uh, rejection of outside, of, of public conscience, for example, uh, but most of them uh, followed him to uh, such an extent that it became very difficult to resurrect the notion of natural law, meaning that there are principles in the world, real principles in the world, uh, which can be discovered and uh, taken as uh, items to be considered conscientiously hmm, by all uh, men. One of the uh, consequences of this Lutheran individualism was of course that God became more and more irrelevant to thinking because he is not directly connected with anything you can know, right? He is simply in your private conscience, he is there, but on the outside there is no way to say anything about it except he made the world as it is, that's it. Right? So eventually, this uh, individualism became, as they say in modern language, secularized. And so it, the idea of God dropped out of the uh, picture. And then you see the rise of mo typically modern ideologies uh, such as scientism and neo-humanism, which are, uh, despite protestations by uh, many libertarians, very much present in a libertarian uh, common talk, so to speak. I'm not referring to uh, particular authors, but the, uh, say, the rank and file libertarian mindset is, is very much uh, tinged with scientistic and neo-humanistic uh, ideas. Scientism, as you know, is the idea that every uh, thing can be scientifically understood and explained only if you apply the methods of the natural sciences. <coughs> natural sciences, first physics and later biology. Uh, libertarians have been weaned away from the first physical uh, scientism, which was very uh, popular in the 19th century, eh, with the social physics of the social engineers, uh, which Friedrich Hayek uh, criticized very effectively. But then Friedrich Hayek uh, imported his own kind of biological scientism. Right? When he began to talk about the evolution of society, social evolution, the evolution of law, and all this was a sort of uh, using bio biology-based uh, arguments to make his view, classical, liberal, semi-libertarian, however you want to qualify them, seem uh, scientifically warranted. So it was a sort of uh, science, scientific reasoning that crept back in, not in the form of physics, but in the form of biology. And of course today with the, uh, the neurosciences, uh, the distinction between physics and biology is almost completely uh, wiped away, so that you have uh, a more insistent uh, return to uh, physics, riding back in on the back of the uh, physical science, such as neurology. Neo-humanism, too, is uh, very sympathetic to uh, scientific ideas, especially the biology-based uh, version. Uh, the, 
it's amazing if you go through the, the new neo humanist literature, also atheist uh, literature, that's another name for the same thing. Uh, how often they referred to uh, Bertrand Russell's uh, famous uh, sophism, which he wrote down as, as a young boy. That is, if a protozoan cannot think logically, then neither can man. Right? So uh, biology proves that you have no free will unless you are willing to say that free will was already present in uh, the very simple cells. But of course, uh, Russell, by the time he became uh, a public intellectual rather than a philosopher of mathematics, he was not too particular about uh, consistency uh, because one of his other famous quips was, uh, most men would sooner die than think, in fact, they do. Right? So they, uh, the idea here is that you have to choose to think. Right? Uh, so what does it tell us about human beings and protozoa? I'm not sure. Anyway, his daughter uh, noted in her recollections of her father concerning the question, uh, do we have free will? My father said no, writing as a philosopher, but he acted yes and wrote yes when his moral passions were engaged. So that is... I think it's a, that's a very typical uh, attitude among modern intellectuals and also among uh, libertarians we are, who are much engaged on the one hand in political current affair actions and they want to do something but they also want to cover their backside, let's say, uh, against criticism from whatever is current in, in scientific views. Now, the purely physicalist notion of the human being, which is illustrated by uh, scientism and neo-humanism, has as a result a fairly technological approach to human beings and to human progress. Progress is mostly thought of and presented as a conquest of nature, conquering the forces of nature. But of course, if man is seen as but another natural species, the no that notion of uh, progress implies increasing man's power over man, because it's just another thing that can be ma manipulated, and the point is if you can manipulate, control it, then you should control it. And so there is a, a temptation to look at other people as simply a matter that can be molded and manipulated and shaped and uh, put into a certain form. This uh, is, of course, another way, uh, another dimension in which modern thinking is completely different from medieval thinking. i just say a few words on uh, the change from the concept of law to the concept of a legal system. The common element in uh, law from the medieval times to modern times is that from about the end of the 11th century uh, medieval thought was enriched with the discovery of the Roman law books of the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century. Right? Uh, but that was of course something that did not touch ordinary life uh, immediately for many centuries, but it was important in the universities. So what happened was that in the medieval universities, uh, you saw the beginning of a study of law that was completely uh, divorced from the study of actual uh, life. It was an academic study, the law, uh, the Roman law. And for that reason, the two things happened. It was not an immediate problem 
to adapt the uh, Roman law to the stateless conditions of medieval times. But uh, it was important to, uh, as it were, find principles in it that were compatible with Christianity, because the universities were Christian uh, institutions. So the medieval theologians read the Roman law in the light of their main principles. First medieval principle is the equality of all human persons, regardless of rank, status, and position, under God and therefore under natural law. So all uh, inequalities in position and rank are due to problems of local organization, household, economic problems. They are not basic to understanding the law. Second principle uh, of medieval law, uh, famous, famously uh, formulated by St. Augustine, lex in justa non est lex. An, an unjust law is not a law at all. Right? So justice is always a conditio sine qua non of your understanding of law. And the third principle of uh, medieval law is the famous uh, admonition uh, you find in Romans 13, first, first verse, uh, by uh, St. Paul, uh, where he says, authority comes only from God. And that meant that since it is unthinkable that God will ever uh, authorize uh, or sanction any uh, injustice or malice or even incompetence, an evil, malicious, incompetent ruler has no authority at all. Right? You either have authority, and then it is the authority which can be attributed to God, or you do not have authority, and then you can have, cannot claim authority. So that meant that uh, the people, the Germanic peoples, who had settled in the, uh, the territories abandoned by the Roman Empire, and the church could depose uh, any ruler uh, for sheer incompetence or uh, moral inadequacy. Now, when the uh, medieval period was at its end, and then we are entering the 15th and 16th century, uh, the, a number of revolutions occurred almost simultaneously discussed already Luther, but you had the general area, uh, era of the Renaissance, you had the emergence of the absolute uh, monarchies, uh, emergence of uh, science, uh, the natural science and so on. And also the, re the re-emergence of the Roman law, but this time uh, freed from the medieval Christian interpretation that had been put on it. Because what the Christian uh, interpretation had removed were princ principles like these. Uh, the, 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 the prince, whatever pleases the prince has the force of law. Hmm? That was smuggled away because that was completely uh, foreign to medieval thinking. Uh, the principle that the, the prince is above the law, is not bound by law, that of course had also had to go in the me medieval times, but it was indispensable to the claims of the absolute monarchies. Okay? And they added, the moderns added, directly as a result of the Lutheran uh, agitation, uh, the principle cuius regio, eius religio. Okay? He who controls the land, controls the religion of uh, his subjects. That was also a repudiation of the, the role of the uh, medieval king or ruler that was as a defender of the common fate, not as the, the person who decided what the fate of his country would be. Right? So this was uh, a complete revolution. Uh, the theme, I will mention it, not elaborate it, but what the, the structure of the Roman law as a legal system uh, concerns 
you have to understand that it is based on the notion of a society. Now, the medieval world was not a society. It was a inter, uh, a mesh of uh, communities and, and, and later cities. Uh, it was very non-structured, but very uh, fluid in its development. And there was, the law was not a system imposed on it. The law was simply that which followed from uh, the reality of life. If you applied principles of natural law, or to go back to the, the former concept of a conscience, uh, the gradual institutionalization of the common human conscience. And that was the, the idea of law. The controlling factor in law was this bringing together in a common conscience so that everybody had, as it were, access to the law, to the same law. Uh, when conscience was privatized, there was no longer a common conscience, a conscience so the, uh, the law of the prince became an ersatz conscience. You could appeal publicly to the law and that was it. Uh, positive uh, notion. But the, the structure of that society on which, to which uh, this system was applied was a vertically structured society with top position and bottom positions and positions in between. And the principle of, of organization was that the lower position was responsible or answerable to the higher position. Meaning that at the very top, there was no responsibility. Right? So at the top of the legal system, it was total irresponsibility, which was fine for the Roman emperors and was also fine for the absolute monarchies right? in, the, in the 16th century. And of course, that had implications for the, the view, the idea of God, right? because God was still uh, in the, uh, the highest of authorities. He became a totally irresponsible God. Complete will without control, whereas the medieval god was the epitome of responsibility. Because the notion of God in medieval times was that God represents everything that sets man apart from the rest of nature. So it was a very humanized uh, God, but he had all these virtues or excellences uh, in a not to be bettered uh, degree. But irresponsibility is not something that sets man apart from the animals, right? Animals are not responsible beings, so there is a continuity uh, between man and animal if you take irresponsibility as the, uh, as it were, the basic notion of freedom. I do not have to answer to you, right? Get lost. That's, you dismiss the other uh, arbitrarily. You feel you are not responsible to anything. That was, of course, not uh, permitted under medieval law, where you always had to be able to answer, uh, will, willing and able to answer questions uh, raised to you. So this freedom as irresponsibility was at first uh, located at the very top of this social structure with the king or the emperor, but then in modern times it became a demand for more and more uh, people. Right? So people wanted to be free, meaning that uh, the area where they could act irresponsibly without having to answer to anybody would increase. And uh, if you consider not only libertarians, but also the people who are, uh, as it was, shocked by libertarianism, modern libertarianism, it is often this aspect of irresponsibility, this idea of, I do not have to answer your question. Who do you think you are? Right? This, this kind of uh, individualism that is uh, really dismissive of uh, questions of argumentation. <coughs> That's it. I am going to conclude here. My time is up. And uh, I could, of course, go answer questions.
about the medieval ideas more in detail, but that will be for another occasion. Thank you.